This has been an extraordinary experience for both of us. And to see the product of what you've been working on for a number of years, but really extensively over the last year or so, is amazing. And I'm sure that many of you will agree with us when you see the book itself, 340 pages on an artist that was literally not known before you began your work. This is rare, and it's substantial, and it's a piece of research that is very seldom done. So I hope you will appreciate fully the importance of what this group has produced. And I'm sure that it will help bring back De La Show. Now what I'm going to do this evening is to try and place Leon De La Show within the context of the 19th century, within the context of some artists that he knew and some artists that he could have known. And any reconsideration of the career of Leon de la Chaux has to be framed by the artist's trend-setting ability to work in several countries in order to establish himself first in the decorative arts and after 1876 as a painter. In doing this, de la Chaux was introduced to the artistic culture of the United States, becoming an American citizen and supporting the traditions absorbed from artists in France. These links had a strong impact on Delachaux's evolution as a creator, and they need to be examined in detail, some of which will begin this evening, in order to understand how Delachaux worked and who his primary influences were. And to accomplish this, we shall partially reconstruct several aspects of Delachaux's life his training, and his amazingly extensive exhibition history, both in France and in the United States. Now, when Léon de la Chaux returned to France in 1883, after five years in Philadelphia, he already had trained himself extensively at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, which you see on the screen. Then a leading art school that had just moved into a very forward-looking building designed by the architect Frank Furness. While at the Pennsylvania Academy, Delachaux was enrolled in courses taught by the American realist. This is the interior of this amazing building. The American realist Thomas Aikens, then considered one of the most controversial artists of his era. And while at the Pennsylvania Academy, from 1876 to 1881, Delachaux most likely took courses in antique drawing, a tradition of working from plaster casts. He also worked in life studies, where Aiken's impact would have instilled in the young artist the necessity of close observation and heightening the realism of the body. The courses were based on the European academic tradition, but the atmosphere in Philadelphia was very progressive. Maybe it's the Pennsylvania Academy calling. <laughs> Delachaux's ability to absorb Aiken's lessons during the period 1876 to 1881 inspired the young artist to think positively about the various models he studied, incorporating Aiken's ability to focus on the psychological character of his models so that they would appear much more than inert mannequins. He also was made aware of Aiken's interest in photography, as has been slightly suggested this evening, a tool then significant to many artists. Certainly, Delachaux would have known photography. I was shown the other day by Marie the container for a photographic camera. There was no photography camera in the, the box, but it de definitely had Delachaux's name inside. And these qualities from e Aiken's were noticeable in Delachaux's major works of this period, including his detailed, unusual study on the screen now of 1881 of a black banjo player. It is a painting that captured the exuberance of an actual performance in the front of a home where a young child can be seen observing it from the floor of an interior room. The interest in focusing on the banjo 
suggests how Delachaux used American popular <laughs> instruments during his time at the Pennsylvania Academy. The quality of accuracy, and look at this work by Aikens, also found in certain paintings by Aikens, which Delachaux would have had an opportunity to study. The parallels here are unquestionable. Here's another work by Aikens. Now, Delachaux maintained his interest in close observation and realism on his return to France, where he forged a very close bond with the academic naturalist, Pascal Adolf Jean Daniel Bouveret, an artist who is now slowly coming into his own. And there are collectors and supporters of Daniel Bouveret in this audience, Madame Saint Marc, Christine Bettineau, and others. He's really an important figure. And he got to know, Delachaux got to know, Daniel Bouveret with whom he studied most likely from 1883 until 1884, maybe longer. And this is a self-portrait by Daniel Bouveret in a private collection here in Paris. While it is always complicated and, and extremely difficult to demonstrate the impact of one contemporary painter on another, Daniel Bouveret in the early 1880s was coming into his own as a major artist and as the principal academic naturalism, naturalist excuse me, after the death of Jules Bastien Lepage in 1884. Interested in advancing the cause of naturalist paintings destined for the Paris Salon, Daniel Bouveret's works were not only driven by a storyline, as in this painting in the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore, The Accident, but were completed with a scrupulous attention to the details of the location and an interest in revealing how the various figures in the composition reinforce the basic narrative of a popular theme. Daniel Bouveret's paintings suggest the influence of a contemporary novel, making his works easily understandable to a wide audience. And this approach also became apparent in any number of genre themes by Delachaux, which focused on family life such as tending to children in the quiet of a domestic interior. These qualities became hallmark traits of Delachaux's work. There were also tendencies that he would have discussed with Daniel Bouveret on social occasions as well as in the studio. Although the relationship with Daniel Bouveret has proven difficult to document, and perhaps someday we'll know more about this relationship, or the discovery of photographs or the discovery of letters, there are certain reasons why Delachaux would have sought him out for advice on returning to Paris. First, both Aikens and Daniel Bouveret had studied under the, sup the supreme academic painter of the era, Jean-Léon Jérôme. Even if they did not work in Jérôme's studio together, Delachaux would have learned of the French contacts when he worked in Philadelphia. Second, seeing Daniel Bouveret's salon naturalism and his ability to bring contemporary scenes to life would have given Delachaux the confidence that he too could create scenes drawn from life while maintaining an exacting attention to detail. At the same moment in time, Delachaux became a member of the artistic colony of Grey Selwang, shown here on the screen. It's complicated. There are many simultaneous influences on Delachaux at the same time. This international community of French, American, British, and Scandinavian artists with similar inclinations not only reinforced Delachaux's global interest, but also encouraged him to move beyond genre scenes to the creation of exceptional landscapes. In this, he also took inspiration from Daniel Bouveret. Yes, he was a landscape painter. Although Daniel Bouveret is best known for his genre paintings and his massive religious compositions of the 1890s, he had an intimate interest in completing landscape compositions that were developed from keen observation of some favorite locales. This is a Daniel Bouveret. Look at it. It doesn't look like anything else that I've shown you. It's an extraordinary painting. And this is another Daniel Bouveret. He's a great landscape painter. And there may be many paintings like this out there. The small outdoor compositions 
Daniel Bouveret did throughout his life revealed a keen understanding of light and atmospheres, ideas that could have been passed on to Delachaux as two artists work together. In this mix comes another artist, Jules Alexis Meunier, another of Daniel Bouveret's colleagues in Jerome's studio. And he could have instilled further in Delachaux the importance of producing landscapes that exuded a sense of isolation and quietude, the peacefulness of nature observed intently. For Meunier, it was the landscape of the Franche Comté. This is a Meunier that attracted his attention when he wasn't living in Paris. Delachaux's own landscape seemed indebted to these academic painters who revealed that they valued nature as much as they did in completing genre compositions. Now, despite returning to France, Delachaux continued to exhibit his works in the United States and even in South America. From 1880 to 1915, he showed regularly within the United States, and from 1884 to 1890, he exhibited at the Salon des Artistes Francais in Paris. But once the Salon of the Société Nationale des Beaux-Arts was inaugurated in 1890, Delachaux showed work there from 1891 until 1914. Exhibits where his colleagues, Daniel Bouveret and Meunier, were pl playing increasing roles as organizers. Probably wondering what this is. Well, it's opening day at the Société Nationale, and every one of the major members of the Société Nationale in this date of 1890 is figured in this reproduction. The administrative ladder, Delachaux became an associate in 1895, associate in 1901, and a member of the jury in 1903. Significantly, the Société Nationale became the best venue for all artists to show their work, as there was no restriction on the number of objects that could be shown, and it was open to international currents and participation. The Société Nationale, shown here, as I pointed out, provided a venue for younger academically trained artists who wanted to reach a large public. In addition, the public audience also secured works for their collections from the annual salon. Now, it was during the late 1880s that Delachaux exhibited works at the salons that reflected both where he was living in Grey Solon, near Nemur, and the importance that the artist placed on being a student of yet another artist of the period by the name of Ernest Duez. In 1887, Delachaux showed his work at the Kunstmuseum in Zurich. And in the exhibition catalog, Delachaux's tie to Duez is clearly noted. But his work is more of a reflection of the impact. Wait. That's the one before. Yeah, that's fine. An impact of. Daniel Bouveret and Duez. The intense interest in children, combined with realist detail, made this work a success at the Paris Salon. This is one of these paintings. And again, he showed his works at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, further documenting the international success that Delachaux was garnering. And he also, importantly, received an award, an honorable mention at the Salon. In 1888, at the Paris Salon, Delachaux still mentioned that he was a pupil of Douay's as he exhibited a landscape in the Berrichon interior, a work that seemingly did not reflect the lighter, more fashionable approach to figure compositions stressed by Douay's. At the same exhibition, he exhibited a very significant work, which won considerable attention. It was also shown at the Paris World's Fair of 1889, where Delachaux won a bronze medal. And importantly, while Delachaux was winning a medal, his colleague, Daniel Bouveret, and I hope we get it right, <coughs> Daniel Bouveret was also recognized at the Salon and the World's Fair. His women at a Brittany pardon on the screen now, 
in the Gulbenkian collection in Lisbon is his most famous painting. But at the same time, he also exhibited this work. There are two styles simultaneously with Daniel Bouveret. This is known as the Madonna of the Trellis, a painting that just came up for sale a few months ago at Sotheby's. So Daniel Bouveret's work created considerable discussion among critics and attendees. And it is obvious that Delachaux was moving in the right academic circles at the time, as his career was beginning to be honored and noticed by many. We hold it a minute. La Loué a Chateau Landon, which I believe, no, is, you know, after 50 years of teaching, I still have trouble getting the right images. Here is this painting. This work was recognized for its accurate and sensitive visualization of servants being selected to work in the homes of wealthy individuals. This led to the work eventually being donated to the museum in the small city of La Chaux de Fond in Switzerland. This location, let me jump ahead, also possessed during the 1890s and first decade of the 20th century, works by a local artist who can be classified as a realist naturalist by the name of Edward Kaiser. He was beginning to be collected and his works were being shown and if you go to La Chaux de Fonds, they have a tremendous selection of Kaiser's work. And he deserves better fame. Here's another work by Kaiser. These are amazing naturalist paintings by artists who all, like Delachaux, have fallen through the cracks with this obsession that the world has had with the avant-garde, with modernism. Now, certainly Delachaux was a painter of his time who benefited from the artistic influences of several countries, the United States, France, and even Switzerland. And he became internationally popular. And by the close of the 1890s, Delachaux's career had moved forward, even though he was often in frail health. His output remained substantial. He was a recognized member of the Salon Naturalists, he had contacts with the more important members of the academy, especially Daniel Bouveret. He also followed an exceptional exhibition system that revealed that he was an active participant in shows on both sides of the Atlantic. By 1898, he exhibited in a group exhibition at the prestigious gallery Georges Petit, along with such artists as Theophil Steinlin, and Emil Klaus, look at this painting, then one of the principal Belgian naturalists. He could be seen as one of the most significant members of this tradition, a way of creating that was soon to be surpassed by all the varied overtones of the new avant-garde. But far from being surpassed, Delachaux's work now stands today at a moment of full rediscovery. And his role as a friend of many others of the era assures this rediscovery to proceed with speed, with insight, accuracy, and awareness. Thank you. <laughs>